Coming up on tonight's episode, Matt and I have caught the conversation bug about coronavirus. We're going to be talking about its impact on ourselves, the country, the world, and what you need to know about how to survive in the world of corona. It's all coming up for you right now. This is Up for Debate, episode number 185, recorded August 27th, 2020, Mentally Distancing. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Up for Debate, the debate podcast where the two hosts agree on everything. I'm Sean Jennings, joined, as always, by a man who was shoving swabs up people's noses before it was cool, Matt Mariani. Hello, Matt. Hello, Sean. How are we doing? Uh, I'm, I'm, How are we I, feeling today? I, I'm feeling uh, a lot of fatigue, some nausea. Uh, oh. I can't taste or smell anything. Uh, you you may have a, a you may fever. have an issue there. No, I the thing is, Matt, I always feel this way. So I, ju- I, I just am in poor health in general. Well, I can tell by that shirt that uh, you very clearly have lost your sense of taste. Oh, it's funny because <laughs> it's true. Uh, Actually, I think that's a very it's a very cool shirt. It's very uh, looks very very neat. I I, I was going to say very comfortable, but. A lot of people get weird when you tell them their shirts look comfortable. You ever have that experience? No one has ever said that to me in my entire life. That looks like a very comfortable shirt. But what I mean to say is that I would very much like a shirt like that because I like to be comfortable. Did I ever tell you that uh, the the head of HR at my company once said to me, uh, Sean, you look good in that shirt. And I said, don't you mean that shirt looks nice on me? And she goes, what? I'm like, well, you shouldn't comment on a person's appearance, but you can cl- comment on the clothes they wear. Do you know the difference? She was not happy I said that. But she's an HR. She should know. You don't say someone looks good in a shirt. You say the shirt looks good. No, yeah, I totally agree. The fr- phrasing is everything. And it was Phrasing weird. is everything. It was a weird thing to say. Like, you look nice in that shirt. And I'm like, are you coming on to me? Uh, yeah, I would have said, what, I don't look nice every day? <laughs> That's what it is. What, I look bad in all my other shirts? <laughs> Just just this shirt that makes just, me look just nice? Just flip her off and walk away. Um, and then she said, Sean, you're fired. You're fired. Deserved. <laughs> Deserved. Uh, Matt, we are back. You know, it's crazy. I looked at the calendar. Do you know the last time we did a non-Rocky, just like normal episode? Uh, it was probably before the quarantine. No, it was April. But still, it was a long time yeah. ago. That was basically before the quarantine. It, that it was like it was, it was early quarantine. Yes, it was like stage one quarantine. Yes, circa um, April BC. I don't know. That was that was like before quarantine BQ. You have like BQ, and then there's before quarantine and then DQ. Say, you you could have just is, what, why why don't you just go with BC for before Corona and a and and AD after disease. Uh, after, after, before Corona, after, after drugs to make you feel better from getting the Corona, after a vaccine, AV. Matt, you keep working on that and get back to us. Uh, (laughs) Matt, we are talking about the coronavirus tonight and its impact on the world in general. Uh, as you and I mentioned to ourselves before the show, we're very qualified to talk about this. Uh, I think it would be fair to say neither of us have any sort of official or unofficial medical training. Um, I'm CPR certified, but I don't think that really helps in this situation. Um, no, as a matter of fact, it, it does the opposite of help because you're not supposed to do CPR when, when uh, actually, the yeah, I, th- I think the official guideline uh, from the Red Cross is that no one's supposed to do CPR until this whole coronavirus is sorted out because... Right. It's one of the easiest ways to contract it. Yeah, I think the headline of that memo just said, let them die. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't have phrased it that way, but I mean, fair point. Uh, Matt, before we get into the, the world at large, I, I wanted to ask you, have you had any uh, personal experience with the coronavirus? Have, have you been tested? Have you believed to have been exposed? Do you know anybody who's been sick? Um, I mean, what what is your corona experience, Ben? We probably should have gotten, well, A, someone more qualified, and B, Maybe someone with more coronavirus experience. I have to be totally transparent here is that uh, I do not know anyone personally who has the coronavirus. I have never been tested, nor have I ever felt the uh, imposing need to be tested. I, I've, I've done, I feel like I've tried my best to do uh, the quarantine the right way, which was uh, just, just totally isolate myself from everybody 
And no, I uh, I, I do not. Good answer. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've I've seen videos on Netflix. Have you ever you seen the Netflix uh, special on the coronavirus? No. Do they sort of show the whole? It's pretty good. It's it's a few episodes long. Every episode's only like twenty to thirty minutes, and it it really does a great job. Of uh, I highly recommend that to anyone who who uh, wants to be really scared at first, and then like slightly less scared by the end of it because they really do a good job of explaining um the part that made me very scared in the beginning is talking about how widespread the infection rate is and how um how basically that this is completely flabbergasted all of the most brilliant minds in medical science the, the the nature of the virus and also that the virus could be with us for a very very long time to come but what what made me feel a lot better is that they they have a chart and it ranks the coronavirus among all of the other pandemics that humankind has been through over the years. And in terms of severity mm-hmm. and death rate, coronavirus actually ranks like really, really low. So it was actually it was lower than the Spanish flu, lower a lot lower than smallpox. Smallpox was a was a was a killer. Smallpox was a put the hurt on on humanity for a long time. Smallpox was way up there. Um, and they also use the graph to they like it was kind of like a mobile graph where you can manipulate data sets. And they used the um, HIV AIDS pandemic as an example of manipulating data because the um, HIV AIDS pandemic was super super high, right in the seventies and eighties. It was mm-hmm. a very high death rate. And then now, thanks to modern medicine, it's an extremely low death rate. So they just like they moved it down and they said, like, coronavirus is already pretty low. And, you know, just to move it lower would put it in the range of like um, extinct, basically. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, actually, the the HIV, the, the death rate after the medicine came out, like lowered to under coronavirus. And so coronavirus is like a little bit higher than that now. But they were like. We can bring it down if we get a vaccine. Yeah, it's also, you know, it's it's fascinating when you look at different diseases over time because, you know, in the modern day versus sort of the, the ancient times where uh, on the pro side, we obviously have more medical advances, more testing, more ability to, to vaccines and things of that nature. But on the other hand, we're a much more global society. You know, when a when an outbreak used to occur in a single region, you know, it would affect the people there and it wouldn't go too far. And now you get on a plane, you get on a... You get on a boat, you you know it's it's so easy to spread uh, worldwide, as we saw with with the coronavirus. Um, so it really is a, a different time. Uh, yeah, you know, Matt, I've uh, I've been tested twice for coronavirus myself. Um, both times were negative, uh, which is good. Um, sort of unpleasant, but not the worst thing in the world. Uh, getting those swabs up the nose. And uh, yeah, I know I know some folks who have, who have had coronavirus, uh, not some asymptomatic, some symptomatic. Uh, it's a really, it's a really, uh, it's a really zany disease for sure. Now they, they, um, they say the coronavirus, the telltale sign there is the loss of taste and smell, right? That's the, that's like it, that, the biggest differentiator from because all the other symptoms kind of parallel themselves with the the uh, novel virus, well, not the novel virus, but the just the typical common cold, right? Right, and the H one N one, and, and virus. theoretically the the sore throat was another one they pointed at for a while. That while you can get to uh, you can get that in a, in a flu or a cold, um, you know the, the way the coronavirus primarily will infect somebody is is through your mouth, and then the coronavirus actually sticks and begins infecting you in your throat. Um, and so that's sort of a telltale sign as well. And that's why it becomes such a respiratory disease. Mm. Yeah. So the, the um, I think the, the crazy thing about it is, uh, oh, did you hear, you heard about COVID toes? Yes. Yes. I had a coworker uh, who uh, I saw some photos. So that's a real thing then. Yeah. COVID toes. Yep. That's also connected to the circulatory, respiratory, circulo respiratory pathways, right? Yeah. Not getting enough blood to the toes and or 
uh, yeah, it results in like the toes getting like bright red and almost like a pinkish hue. Yeah, it's uh, the the gentleman I knew who got it. He's a, a competitive weightlifter, very tall, very jacked, uh, and in very good shape. And he explained that his whole body uh, was on fire, basically, uh, and not even in like a feverish way, but in a your nerves aren't acting right kind of way. Um, wow, extremely unpleasant. One of the more uh, extreme cases I personally had heard of. So almost like a like a myalgic yeah. quality to it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pain, pain, muscle pain. Yep. Which now this may surprise you, Sean, but I, I don't think I've ever had the flu. Okay, I you're full of shit. <laughs> That's not a. You know what? That's such a Matt Mariani statement too. Matt, how long you know, did you go without knowing you tore your ACL? Sean, I am a medical marvel. Okay. I've never had anything wrong happen to me. There's. Uh-huh. I'm are, just you, are you are you the guy things. of like well it's only a crime if you get caught like you only had the flu if you noticed you had the flu you have to get diagnosed with the flu and I don't go to doctors so there <laughs> <laughs> says man on his deathbed I've never been sick before I don't have cancer that no doctor told me it only it's only uh, it only happens when you get told that it's happening so oh, man. That does not no me. news is good news you've had and, the flu uh, Matt. you've had the flu impervious I, mean, I don't need to be a doctor to tell you that. I don't really know. I've I've been sick before for sure, but again, I rarely go to doctors, so I don't really know if uh, if I if I've ever had the flu. I mean, I, went, I could just be I could just be immune to it. Yeah, it's you know the flu is one of those weird things. I mean, do you normally get the flu shot? I I have recently started getting the flu shot consistently. Before that, I would say I've gotten it, but more inconsistently. But now. Now I get it every year. Because I went for a span of like 10 years without getting a noticeable flu. And then for the past like three years, I've gotten like an aggressive multi-day flu once every year. So it's just weird. Like, I guess it just depends on who you're around. And Maybe when I was younger, I think I've probably got like growing up. I remember definitely being like really sick and being having like fevers and cold sweats and things like that. So that's probably the flu. Um. I started getting it when I when I went to college and when I started spending time around coworkers who had small children. When, once I started working, I, my first like real job out of college, I worked in an apartment where everyone in my area had small children and I was constantly sick. Constantly. It <laughs> drove me crazy because I swear you could mark it on a calendar. Coworker would say, yeah, I don't think my kid's feeling really well. And then it would be like three days later, the employee <laughs> didn't start feeling well. And then like two days after that, I would get sick. And I'm like, you, so I knew as soon as they said their kid was getting sick, calendar. I was literally like, don't come near me because Sean's going to be sick this day. <laughs> mind you, mind you, this was a team that not only had small children, but was also flying to China and Saudi Arabia and Europe like every week. And so they were constantly on airplanes and around sick children. I don't know how I survived. Yeah, airplanes. Can we talk about that for a bit? Airplanes have been. Uh, have you flown during the uh, this pandemic at all? No, I've been grounded. I have not flown since I flew in January. So I flew right when it was, um, right when it was starting to come to the U.S. But I haven't been in the air since. Okay. Yeah, I, I know people who have flown. They didn't haven't gotten sick, but. Um, I have not flown personally. I've, I haven't had any occasion to. Uh, I, I we went on a brief vacation to Cape Cod, which was pretty awesome. That was toward the very end of the quarantine when places were already starting to open up again, and mm-hmm. um, that was a weird experience. Have you have you been to a beach during this pandemic? I mean, to be fair, man, I don't go to a beach when there's not a pandemic. I'm not I'm not really a big beach guy. Uh, so, uh, no, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't traveled at all since I was in Vegas in January. Yeah. That, uh, the beaches are uh, interesting. The ones we went to by the Cape, because you can't wear a mask. You're on a beach. You're going to get all those weird mask tan lines and whatever. So you have to be very conscious of the social distancing, which I will say that people, people in the Cape did a very good job at that. Um, being uh, six feet apart and setting up setting up their stuff six feet apart. I did hear a, an interesting story from one of the lifeguards on one of the beaches. Uh, he was telling another lifeguard, and I overheard he uh, had stopped a, I guess a, a, a gentleman had set up his his uh, towel and and stuff 
he received a complaint from a, a woman on the beach that this gentleman had set up a very, very much too close to her site. Mm -hmm. And she wanted him moved and he was refusing to, to move and respect her social distancing. So she got the lifeguard involved and the lifeguard came over. And I guess he was, um, now that I think about it, now that I'm telling the story, it's probably his, his fault for not <laughs> identifying himself as a lifeguard. He came over and he said, we, he said, please move your stuff away from this this uh, this lady, this beachgoer, like or this patron, customer, beachgoer, passerby, yes, your fellow beachgoer, yeah. Um, you know, you're, you're you're too close, and we're trying to maintain six feet social distance. To which he responded, "Let me I'll tell you what. Let me finish my sandwich, and then I'll consider it." Mm. And then the fantastic burn. The life the lifeguard then said. Well, you can consider it, but I'll be back here with local law enforcement. I guess he didn't know that the, that he was a lifeguard. I guess yeah, yeah, he should have probably should have led with that. But, yeah, I would think he didn't show his um, his lifeguard badge. He didn't show his he didn't show his badge. <laughs> he didn't show his packs. I think that's the the true indication of a lifeguard's got to be the packs. It's always that big uh, red foam thing. Mm -hmm. That that's yeah. how I know it's a lifeguard. What? Is, yeah, that floaty, the floaty that they have. Or, yep. or they're the red shorts, white sh white shirt. Yeah, or it's David Hasselhoff. Yes, instantly. Instantly uh, lifeguard. Yeah, you know, the social distancing is so fun. It's such a funny concept to me. Because, A, I, it's just a good policy even when there's not a pandemic because people do stand too close to me. But also, I, I, and we can talk about the misinformation of the coronavirus and all of this, but it's also one of those things where it's like, does that, like, six feet is such an abstract number to me. Like, like, is does that mean five feet is that much less safe and seven feet is that much safer? It's just a weird... It took me a while. I actually... I saw this very funny chart online. If I find it, I'll send it to you, Matt. But it was, like, things that are six feet long. Because I have no concept of distance. In, it's just one of those things, like, you could say, Hey, Sean, how, how long is that? And I'm like, ah, I just can't eyeball distances. Six feet is two adult golden retrievers end to end. Oh, that's, a, that's actually very helpful. And I was like, yeah. okay, that I can imagine, right? Yes, yes, I don't know what six feet that. is. Mm -hmm. I know how big golden retrievers are. I have the same issue. I, I'm, very, I'm very, very bad at spatially figuring out measurements. Terrible at it. Like, I'm, I'm, oftentimes I'm, I'm actually shocked when I find out, like, things are always way lo longer or way smaller distances than I, than I imagine them to be. Yep. Yeah, so a helpful tip for you there. Um but uh, it's just an odd, and you know, man, I'm, I'm back in the office, so I'm wearing a mask all day long every day. I'm, I'm doing my best to social distance. Um, and it's, uh, it's been a unique challenge. I haven't gotten into any fights with anybody yet about being too close. So I'm, I'm thankful about that. Yeah. It, this, I, is there any, do we have any backstory? I, I hate to make you do some work here, but. Is there any backstory about the six feet? Like, what is there any uh, you know, there, way? You know what's funny is I read like the sort of like first paragraph of an article that it's actually um, there like, actually is there is an interesting story behind the six feet. Yes, and it's it's very weird. Um, now I feel like we're an NPR podcast. We're telling you things that you may not have known. Honestly, probably our best skills as hosts is just how fast we can... Look things up on the fly. Yes. <laughs> uh, Pretend like we knew it all along. It actually dates back to... I'm going to see if I can find a better article. But it actually dates back to the 1930s, believe it or not. This isn't a new concept, and it's not a concept specific to... Um, it's Harvard researcher William F. Wells back in the 1930s measured how far large exhaled droplets traveled uh, and arrived at a three-foot distance. Now, there's some evidence that coronavirus specifically can spread farther because it will actually attach to smaller droplets. Um, and I believe that's where the uh, the six feet, they just doubled it. And that's where the six oh. feet came from. So it's not it's not anything corona-specific necessarily. Um it says here, yeah. researchers in 2003 researched the SARS virus, which is a version of uh, a type of coronavirus, um, and they found that SARS um, could actually travel farther than the three-foot cutoff, and that was about um, that was about where the, the six-foot number partially came from. 
Wow. So that yeah, that's uh, that makes sense. That's that's legit. Six feet. Um, speaking of the droplets, right? I I know that the is a weird thing to talk about for the virus, but I guess the 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 nature, the characteristics of the virus itself. They say that it is um, it's not it's atypical in that it's not airborne, right? It's not it doesn't linger in the air. The masses of the droplets are heavy enough to uh, stay they, where they were. The big fear was surfaces. Remember, wiping down all your surfaces. And that was the big fear. Not so much that it, they're not light enough to remain airborne, but they, they are weighed down and um, stick to the ground or stick to surfaces. Yeah, certainly not like uh, other types of illnesses. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a yeah atypical of I guess a virus or something. Yeah, it, it definitely requires close contact. You know, um, and, and we've seen that with other types of coronaviruses as well. Um, you know, part of the issue is that you know a lot of things can affect those droplets. Uh, even the humidity in a room can affect how far those droplets spread. Now, it's not going to be a huge mega. You know, oh, it only goes three hundred feet, but. Um, it's certainly, you know, six feet is just a recommended guideline, and there are people who say it should be farther. Really, what they, wh- what I've read, and 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 what sort of the general uh, consensus is, is that between social distancing alone is not enough to stop something like this. Mostly because six feet is recommended, and it's very hard to stay six feet away from everybody all the time. It's the combination of six feet and masks that really becomes an effective deterrent. Um, you know, even masks can sometimes not be effective because you don't wear them all the time or different types of masks are less effective. But if you remain six feet and are wearing masks, that's your one-two punch to really to make it effective. Now, Matt, uh, what did your uh, what what masks are you rocking these days? Oh, Sean, I uh, I could show you next week. Right now I have some boring masks, but I just I just went on a binge on Etsy and I ordered some pretty cool masks that uh, I will I will bring to the show they're they're in transit right now. I'm very excited. I I, uh, I ordered just um, I had to I had to go with the one. I'll just tease one of them. The uh, you see the ones where they have um, like a character like character masks yeah. that you've got like the, for the sleeves. I ordered a Darth Vader one of those. Okay, so that's Makes that's sense. gonna be pretty cool. Very fun. Um, the other ones are, are are pretty neat too. I I had to, I had to get some some kind of zany fun masks because you got to make it fun oh, so you're around children you got to do it. yeah you gotta you gotta do it i uh for those of you who don't know uh listening to the show i am a hospital clown i'm one of those clowns that dresses up and works uh, uh, at hospitals. a real patch adams you would say yes patch at patch adams a movie i've never seen i i was Robin gonna Williams. say no i you know i've never seen that i was thinking of the character from doug but that's Smash Adams. Oh, that was he's cool. like the James Bond. Have you ever seen Doug? I have. I do not remember that. He he's like a movie character that Doug wants to imitate. Mm-hmm. Sometimes he's like he's basically the 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 Doug Universe version of James Bond. Smash Adams. Yes, that is a good <laughs> name for like an action star. It is, isn't it? Yeah, starring Smash <laughs> Adams. I like that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, it's funny. I said to a coworker the other day a very sad. I did pause after saying it at how sad it was, but I'm like, "Hey, new mask," and I'm like, "Oh, that's sad." I noticed <laughs> this. This person owns enough masks that I noticed they had a different one. It's become a fashion statement. That's I actually, depressing. honestly, I, w- I wish I had gotten more. Um, I wish I had ordered the uh, the cool masks that I did earlier in the pandemic because now now I don't know how long this is going to last you know it could last another five years it could last another you know just five months I don't know so I want to get the mileage I feel like I'm not I, I may not get the mileage out of out of these masks and I spent a lot of money on these masks well uh, you know Matt That's... I'll I'll let let's see what your opinion on this is because I'm a little controversial on this which is in the same way I want people for the rest of my life to keep six feet away from me please. I kind of wouldn't be mad if we just all were like, let's just wear masks all the time when we're out of the house. If that was like the new social norm. I mean, it's like that in in Asian countries, in certain in, Asian, in certain regions. So the I think the the common practice, at least as as far as I know, and and this is solely based on me just reading things online, not from any personal experience or 
professional experience at all. Um, I, as far as I know, in, in Eastern Asian cultures, um, it's specifically in Japan and Korea and China, it's common practice to wear the mask if you yourself are ill and you're or, or are experiencing symptoms and yeah. you're afraid of transmitting it to others. So you, it's not like everybody would be going out with a mask all the time. I'm totally in favor of that, Sean. And I, I remember a time when I was sick, when I like years ago, and I remember I, I found a mask somewhere in, in my house and I wore it. And like, I got a lot of really strange looks from a lot of people. Like, it was just kind of weird. Like, why is this guy wearing a mask like around? And, um, cause I wasn't wearing like scrubs. I was wearing my normal clothes, but I really do. I think that's one of the major changes I think we will see from this experience with the virus is I think that we'll see, uh, people wearing masks when they're sick outside a lot more, um, in some parts of the country, I don't think it'll be. It'll take hold in all. Parts, but I think it but, should be. That that's what that's oh, what I'm should. saying. It should be. And I agree and, with you. But I, I think, think it should, should be more than people who are sick, though. I don't think it should be everybody all the time. Uh, food service workers should wear masks all the time. I don't think that's an unreasonable ask. No. They are likely I, I, to spread disease. I totally disease. see where you're coming from. I I think you know Matt. One of the one of the worst flus I ever had. I got at a place you would not be surprised at all to get the flu, which is the RV and camping show. And an event like that where you're in a conference hall and there are all kinds of people and you're all touching stuff and going in and out of RVs and all this, it's like everyone there should be wearing a mask. Like, I don't oh, think yeah. that's an, you know, I just feel like if I'm like going out to dinner with you, Matt, and we're having dinner or something like, no, we don't need masks. But I'm just saying, I just think we have to be more, more conscious and more socially acceptable and not be like, oh, it's weird. Why is that guy wearing a mask? Um, I think it should be encouraged. Yeah, I think in, a lot of a lot of times I hear from people going to different conventions. Conventions are usually a hotbed oh, for yeah. for illnesses, um, especially when you know you conventions where you can like pick things up and like look at them and like put them down. And oh, I for mean, that matter, it's uh, uh, Grocery stores. I think that shopping stores, grocery stores, should definitely be places where you wear wear a mask and gloves. I mean, I, I'm not opposed to that. I well, think it um it's 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 no longer inconvenient. As a matter of fact. Leaving for work every day, it's become a, like, a, you know, everybody has their keys, wallet, phone check before they leave for work. It's now become keys, wallet, mask, phone. Well, I keep them, I keep them in my car, to be honest with you. And because anywhere you go and you're like, oh, shit, I probably should. And you just grab it and you put it on. I mean, you know, it's funny, right? I, I'm, I'm in marketing communications and, you know, I plan trade shows for my company. And we're trying to figure out how do you do trade shows in the age of coronavirus when – Everyone was touching and demoing tools. Everyone was shaking hands and exchanging cards. Everyone was standing close to one another in a loud venue where you have to be able to talk to each other. How, how do you do that? And the answer is you don't. And the answer is you change. And maybe people don't get to touch the tools. And there's definitely a no touching rules. And you have lots of hand sanitizer. And everyone has to, you know, you can't congregate in the booth. I mean, you, you got to really think these things through. It is a, it, it's crazy when I think back to January when I was in Las Vegas at at this massive trade show. And I'm like, that's the last time it's ever going to be like that, at least for a long time. Do you think the handshake is dead? I hope it is. I hate the handshake. I've always hated the handshake. <laughs> I really do. I think, I think it absolutely sucks. I'm not against personal contact. I think the handshake is a bad form of personal contact. See, that surprised me because I, when I think Sean Jennings, I think of Big like time the businessman. Uh, yeah, he's a big, big, big time a Don Draper. Uh, no, the, I'm a young business, millennial business. Bus man. I'm a business casual man. You're not a businessman. You're a business man. The the issue I have with the handshake is that which this is nothing to do with Corona, but I do like to talk about it. Is the issue with the handshake is is it's very specific in that the hands have to meet in a certain way or it doesn't work. They clasp and then they shake. Too much contact. Too much coordination. The fist bump. Great. The, now this is turning into a Seinfeld bit. No, but I don't think I'm mean, <laughs> I crazy. To th I'm just saying, like, handshakes are, are weird. You don't – honestly, one, one of the things – and I, I actually picked up this habit working with Europeans when I was doing it for a while – is the shoulder touch. 
Oh, I thought you were gonna say the cheek kiss. They're big on that. No, and then I was no, gonna no, say no, that's no. that is way more unsanitary. No, 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 no. I, it was the Netherlands. It wasn't France or anything like that. But but no, it, it was the when you're talking to somebody, just reaching out and putting your hand on their shoulder as part of the conversation, as a way to bring them in and connect with them. Which sounds See, I think weird. That's weird. No, it yeah. sounds weird. But and you, it's tough to do with someone you're meeting for the very first time. But if it is someone you kind of know, or you're in the middle of a conversation, or even as a goodbye, you just reach out and you just say, "Hey, great conversation. It was great meeting you. Thanks." And you sort of shuttle them off that way, and and it, it works better than you would think. But I've also I done like it to it... people, and they were very weirded out by it. So <laughs> maybe I shouldn't be talking. I had to almost stop doing it for a bit because they would be like, "What the?" F-? I weirded me out when they were doing it to me. So. Eh, yeah, not for everybody. What I don't then, like is the bullshit Corona touching feet or tapping elbows and all, that sucks. Oh, the elbow bump. I no. would rather you just not touch me. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I'm, I'm there. I'm there with you. I, the elbow bump is lame. The foot dapping is lame. Um, yeah, I, I would just, uh, I don't know. I, I don't think, I don't believe that the handshake is dead. I think it's, I think it's gonna still make a comeback after this whole thing is over. I don't think that the coronavirus is going to kill the handshake. You know what I think it's going to do? I'm going to just do? predict that. I think it's going to be handshake people will handshake and non-handshake people will think handshake people are terrible people. That's what, because right now, when <laughs> I've had people who who just didn't give a shit and just stuck their hand out to shake mine. And I'm like, oh, you're a bad that, person. You're, you're, me, I hate like, you. Well, while it's going on, while the pandemic is going on, it is unacceptable to shake people's hands. I agree with you. It's not. I I hate those people that are like, oh, you know, I'm a man. I'm, I don't care. I'm a handshaking man. My daddy taught me to shake everybody's hand. While this is going on, that's got to stop because you know, you're putting people's lives in risk. You know what I did it, once? Someone, uh, I won't say who, but someone, uh, not that they watch the show, but uh, but they, 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 they did and they did the handshake. And right in front of them, immediately after the handshake, I took a bottle of hand sanitizer and went like this, like really, <laughs> like right at eye level. And I was like, it was so great to meet you. That is pretty awesome. Oh, it was great. I bet they didn't shake your hand again. <laughs> I, I, you know what? Uh, to be quite honest, I don't even think they noticed the hand sanitizer. They were so in their own little world that they didn't even notice I did that. You hear that? Patricia. <laughs> Actually, the man was a police officer. We should be very nice. Um, but anyhow. So. Yeah, I, I don't I don't see handshakes going away, but I, they have to go away in the short term. I think that's oh, that's I, pretty clear. No doubt about it. I mean, that's no, no touching. No touching. Something else that's gone away in the short term um, is and, and, and may not, I don't know if it's going to be coming back. We could talk about it. Move. Movies. Going to the movies. Uh, I, you know, I was you thinking think about, about this. I was thinking about this earlier because I knew this was going to be one of the topics we'd probably cover. You know, it's one of those things where movies were sort of not really on the decline. They were just sort of plateauing before all this happened. Um, you know, sort of the big franchises had propped them up, but who knows how long that would have kept up. I think I, I don't think movie theaters are dead. I really don't. To me, movie theaters are boutique. They're, they're sort of, it's more it's more akin to a museum where it's like every town probably has one and you don't go there all that often but you do know it's there and on a special occasion or when you have a specific reason you'll go there that to me is what movie theaters will become yeah what it, it kind of made me think is that there the operating costs of a movie theater right it's got to be relatively low you would think on the day to day, unless something breaks and needs to be repaired or replaced, well, if you which could be very, really expensive. But if you exclude the cost of actually essentially renting the movies from the from the production companies to play it, just like the building and the popcorn and the employees. You're right. I'm sure it's not a very expensive business. I would say it's virtually, yeah, virtually like cheap. I mean, virtually almost for, like got to be almost free. Like you're renting the movies and all that. That's an expense. But the. The, the the operational costs even your lights your your electricity probably isn't that bad because you're dimming the lights I don't know if that's true but um, I I would think that like you said they'll become more boutique they'll become more like date places like you want to have a date and it's like a first or second date you don't feel comfortable enough bringing them back to your apartment or your house yet and uh, that will be the movie theater or you want you your your parent. You want to get your kids out of the house. It's raining out, though, and you're tired of them spending all this time inside. Movie theater is, is your or – or an aquarium. I, I happen to really love the aquarium. I'm a 
big nature guy. But um, I uh, I think that will be the, the purpose that movie theaters will serve in the future. I think they'll probably become smaller and, and more niche. And we, we did a whole episode about this like a couple of years back. It was one of our earlier episodes. Uh, you should check it out. And uh, we talked about how we think movie theaters will be like more kitschy, almost like the like they'll each have their own like gimmick. I think. In, uh, well, it it's sort of like when survive. you survive when you look back to the very first movie theaters, they were opulent, almost like an opera house. I mean, that was really if you see any photos of some of the original movie theaters. I mean, it was gold and it was marble and it was chandeliers. Call, we, call them Nickelodeons. We may go back in that direction, mm-hmm. not necessarily that exact direction, but where. Where you're right, Matt, they are more of a destination where rather than a Regal Cinemas on the corner. Um, by the way, I did quickly look it up, Matt. Uh, movie theaters only keep about 20 to 25% of the ticket cost on the first week of release. The first couple weeks of film release. So for a $12 ticket, they get about 3 bucks of it. The rest uh, goes directly to the uh, the movie company. Yeah, so operational costs must much. They must be low. Yeah. Um, so, but the other thing is, you know, movie theaters for a long time were, were I don't want to say hanging on, but they were chugging along because of technology. You know, first it was you couldn't get a high definition movie at home. Then you couldn't get a 3D movie at home. Then you couldn't get an IMAX movie at home. Then you couldn't get a 4DX movie at home. A- and I think if the technology of in-theater presentations can continue to outpace televisions, there's going to be reasons for people to go. I think 3D was a bit of a bust. I think 4DX may have some legs. We'll see. But just saying the picture looks good is no longer enough to sell people. Um, And I think it opens up. uh, What's interesting for me is not necessarily the future of the theaters, because I do think there is some future there. Uh, For me, it is the future of in-home movie watching, because we don't know how that looks yet. And for the first time ever in the history of movies, we're experimenting with it, whether it's Trolls World Tour that basically only comes out on digital for a price. Um, Mulan, they're doing an interesting experiment where it's 30 bucks to buy, but you have to be a Disney Plus subscriber to buy it and then pay the additional 30. Um, we have Netflix buying movies that were going to theaters and they just put them out on Netflix. So what is the, the quote-unquote correct way to distribute a first-run new release movie not in a theater? We don't know yet. And we're, we're, we're finding out, which to me is very exciting. Now, what do you lean towards? Um, like, I guess when you're, when you're, you, when you, you're, you just, you just produce this movie, right? And, and the Sean Jennings movie uh, is supposed to hit theaters in September. Obviously, that's now not, probably not going to happen. Although, we have seen that there, we could talk about that a little later. There have been some movies that have uh, gone ahead and, and done a theatrical release, Um regardless of the of the um uh, restrictions what what do, what's your what format would you would your movie look like where would you where would you where would you host it how much would you charge well here's the interesting thing right matt because how do you make more money on one movie versus another and that's the the, the truth of the matter is it's multiple showings it, it, it just getting them to see the movie once is not enough you in a perfect world someone would see the movie in theater two or three times then would pay to buy or rent it after that, and then would watch it again when it's run on cable or a pay service after that. A truly beloved film makes money on repeat viewings. The issue is, if it goes straight to Netflix, for example, right? How many Netflix original movies have you rewatched? None. Exactly. Not because they're bad movies, some of them are, uh, but because there's always new content coming through on Netflix, and there's no, the Netflix algorithm doesn't really incentivize you to watch something more than once. Especially not movies. They like series because that's, they want you watching longer, not the same things over and over. They want multiple hours, not a single movie. And so they're losing revenue. They can sell you on that movie once. If you, with the decline of cable and the decline of theaters, if you buy that movie on Amazon Prime, they're getting a paycheck out of you once. And that is what hurts these. Th- that's what's hurting these movie companies. So they've got to get creative. That's why I think rentals will continue to be a push. I think limited time streaming releases, where it's only on a, a Netflix or a Hulu or a or an Apple TV Plus for 
two months and then they shift it somewhere else or they take it off and Disney vault it and then it comes out a year later again. Um, I think the distribution model has to get creative because they just they just cannot say, here's Mulan, it's 30 bucks, you buy it now, don't buy it, whatever, we don't care. Uh, I, I don't think they can financially make it that way. Yeah, that's uh, that's I guess that's why, in my mind, that's why Mulan is being uh, charged for this thirty dollars, right? The 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 price to yeah, purchase buy, Mulan. buy only, no rental. You know, they're trying to get their money's worth out of it because, um, I mean, that's a movie to me that would have. Well, I guess not really rewatchability. I was going to say for the kids, but there's no music. They they took all the songs out of it. Well, yeah, Mulan that was is, like that was the big seller for the kids and Eddie Murphy. Mulan is such an interesting case study in this because, uh, uh, all truth, it, you know, Mulan is is a movie made for the Chinese market. Period. Full stop. They could care if it made zero dollars in the U.S. because it's going to make a ton of money in China. So I think it's different when they um, uh, Disney Plus. I don't, are you familiar with Artemis Fowl, the movie slash uh, book series? Yeah, a little bit. Never read it, but po popular book series, decent books. Uh, Disney spent 140 million dollars and years making a movie version. Absolutely terrible movie. Rather than release it in theaters, they just dumped it on Disney Plus for free and just said we're just going to write off 140 million dollars. I think these are interesting case studies. For me, I think the kids movie market and the sort of franchise movie market are really going to benefit from the move to streaming. Because the Marvel movie, yeah, they'll charge 30 or 40 bucks for it. You got to have it. You got to watch it. The kids movie, your kids are going to want to watch Finding Nemo 8,000 times, right? I think what's going to fall through the cracks is the in the independent films, the smaller films, the non-IP franchise films. You know, when you think of these sort of like a, like a Bridesmaids or a Hangover or some of these like breakout comedies, Judd Apatow's stuff, I, I see that so hard struggling moving forward because... Who's going to give them the money to make those movies when they have to sell it person by person online in a very competitive space and not a movie theater where they can say it's the one movie coming out this week? Hmm. And that's what I think is really going to change here. It's not necessarily an economical calculation. It's a creative calculation where movies are more algorithmically driven than they are creatively because there's so much more competition online. Yeah, if you're... It's almost like they're defeating. They're kind of like stepping on their over their own toes, right? Like they're constantly releasing more content, which is preventing you from rewatching, you know, formerly released content. But I guess it doesn't matter to Netflix because you're you're just paying them the subscription fee. It matters to the producers and the you know writing staff of the movies. Yeah, all that matters to Netflix is that you don't cancel your subscription. You can use it for zero minutes a month or a million minutes a month, and they do not care paying. as long yeah. as you keep paying them. Such an interesting model. You can hate all the content on there, and as long as you keep paying them, they're happy. That's Very weird. Matters. And, you know, I will say that I think if I had to guess in the future how movie theaters will survive, we talked about the boutique nature, but for me it's shorter runs. I think they're going to churn movies in and out of those theaters, and it's – New Marvel movie is in for one week and we're going to sell out every theater and we're going to make our money and we're going to send it to streaming. So next week we are constantly rotating stuff in and out. And, and what that does is it opens. So a movie that would have gone to just streaming because it wouldn't have made enough at the box office. They say, we'll put it up for one week. Maybe it won't be the most spectacular movie, but it's only there for a week, right? You're, you're kind of creating artificial demand by limiting the time period of it. I think that is how you make these movies successful. I don't think a movie can last in theater for five weeks anymore. I just, I just don't think so. I just don't think there's the attention span for that. Either you're seeing it on the midnight opening or you're waiting for streaming. Uh, and so I think you're going to see a lot more churn uh, if, if the movie theaters open back up. Yeah, when do you think that'll be? Because the uh, – and, and when it does happen, will we see a different format in in the sense of uh, seating, seating seating aisles, will will the interior of a movie theater look different because of coronavirus? Well, you know, it's really interesting because if you ask movie theater owners, they want to open now. You ask customers, they don't want to go to the movie theater. Uh, you know, I, I think there's sort of the short term and long term answer. The short term answer is I just don't see them opening anytime soon. I mean, without a vaccine, without people feeling safe, um, you know, they, they're going to be able to open in limited amounts, but. You know, studios are going to keep waiting until they can actually... They, they would rather sit on a movie for a year and a half 
and make money on it than release it now and not make enough money. So I think in the short term, it's it's just going to continue to be like it is now. I think in the long term, I think the interiors of theaters are going to change. But we've already seen this, right, Matt, with with the advent of, of the reclining chair and stadium seatings and, and bigger plush chairs and dine-in theaters. I think theaters are going to have actually less and less seats in them partly because of Corona and, and spacing people out. But I also think chairs are going to get bigger and more opulent. I think a group seating and couple seating is going to be um, more of a thing where it's more couches than chairs, where it's maybe a couple seats around a table at a theater. I think you're going to see more creative seating, not necessarily like quarantine safe seating. Uh, to me, that's more of an interesting reason to get me to go to the theater is I bring five friends we, we have dinner at a table and while a movie's playing, and the food's actually good. Now, okay, well, that, now you're not really interesting because you're making money on the food, you're making money on the movie. Hey, this is cool. And maybe they're playing Ghostbusters or an old movie or something. I'm like, wow, what, a, what an interesting idea that is, you know? So you're al- it's almost like there's a model in, I want to I wanna say Japan. It's definitely maybe Japan or Korea – there's a, a model where, and I think you you might have been the one to tell me about this actually, where a couple of friends will rent an apartment for like just to watch a movie. Yeah, I, I haven't and heard of that. That's interesting. So you, you actually, I think you pay hourly, and it's it's like you get this apartment room for like a couple of hours, and it's it's set up, you know, like a like a a nice apartment where you got you have like a TV and um, a lot of what a lot of a group of friends will like pitch in. And they'll split the cost of like this little apartment to watch a movie together. And that way they don't have to go to each other's homes or it's very popular. I think among high schoolers where they like, you know, their, their parents maybe don't want a lot of people coming over or things like that. Maybe they have a smaller home to begin with, but they, yeah, grow up a couple of friends will, will rent this space. Also college where the people are living in smaller quarters. Um, I always thought that was kind of interesting and, that could be an interesting model for um, the post-corona world. Maybe, it, you know, it's, it's a kind of like a more intimate, personal movie theater. Yeah, well, I think, look, going and sitting in a chair and watching a movie on a big screen is exactly what I can do at home. So you either have to be more in the movies, and that's where I think the 4DX theme park kind of version of movies come in, where the seats are moving and it's spraying water at you, and it's like, I can't do that at home. Or you're less in the movies. And that's where the social aspect or the food aspect or the the whatever. Maybe movie intermissions will come back. Who knows? But something that takes you more out of the movie where it's more of a passive experience. You have to go one way or the other. I just had a, a, a little bit of a brain blast here. Ready for this? Oh, no. Here we go. You have that apartment model. Mm. Where where you you rent the apartment for a couple hours? You watch, we you know we go to the Sean. We we saw this awesome movie. Wasn't that a great movie? Yeah, man, it was a great movie. And we go to leave, but uh oh, the door is locked. I can't open the door, Sean. What happened? Why can't I open the door to this apartment? I I, I thought I thought it it was open from the inside. I know that we locked it, but why can't we open the door? And you're like Matt, what, you don't have a key or anything like that. Where's the key? I don't know. Let's go look for it, Sean. I open a drawer. There's a note in the drawer. The note is a series of numbers and letters. All of a sudden, the movie experience is now an escape room. It's an escape room, and you have to find your way out. And it doubles the fun and doubles the excitement. It doubles what you get your money's worth out of. But then why wouldn't you just open an escape room? It happens randomly, Sean. You don't know. Oh, so you you may (laughs) be able to just open the door. You can't. No, no. In some of them, you can just open the door. But if you get the special room randomly selected, you are all of a sudden on a journey of your own, my friend. And Matt, am I allowed to like one up your idea a little bit? It's a plus up. I like the core. I'm just going to add a layer to it if that's okay. Okay. It's an escape room first. So you go in and you do the escape room, but while you're doing the escape room, a bunch of cameras are shooting you doing the escape room. And through the magic technology of real-time editing, when you finish the escape room, you sit and watch the movie of the escape room you just finished. That's another great idea. In reverse, like my idea, but in reverse. I thought you were going to say 
you're looking for the key and you you stumble upon a DVD and then you decide that you just <laughs> can watch you imagine, that. Could you imagine you go to like a regular <laughs> escape room and you're like, how? And then oh, it's like, it's just Avengers. like, now watch this DVD and it's like Dr. Doolittle or something. Like some, with the wind. some obscure, some like wacky, like, oh, it's minions. And it's like, you have to, like, the clue is in the last minute. The clue of the is movie. in the movie. <laughs> In the movie, and you're, you have you're, to pay like close attention. To you're checking your watch, like we've been doing this for like forty-five minutes. Have you seen a clue? I haven't seen. It's like comes up in the credits. Yeah. By the way, the, the key is in the lamp post. Yeah. Is this viral marketing for the minions? In What's the going lamp- on? This is very weird. Yeah. I, I like this idea. I like this idea. Our 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 uh, pop up pop up escape rooms slash movie theaters yeah. slash movie theaters. Gosh, we're such good businessmen. Um, Matt, is there any other uh, coronavirus uh, stuff you wanted to talk about? Um, is there a, have any of your now, Matt? I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, I am a bachelor, ladies. Uh, I live alone, and I've had a certain coronavirus quarantine experience. But you're married, in case people weren't aware. He's taken, ladies. Um, please call me instead of him. I know I'm your second choice, but there's only two of us here. And I'm wondering, what has the uh, coronavirus quarantine experience been like as somebody who is who is married, being with another person all the time? Um, it's, I think I think it's pretty great. It's been pretty good. Um, I felt I think things felt a little more normal, I guess, because I had somebody to talk to constantly, and that was pretty cool. I, I do feel for a lot of the, the singles out there because I understand this is kind of changing the game for them in a lot of ways. Um, and I, I guess everybody kind of, it seems like everybody kind of has their own threshold with it, their own level of comfort of like, will I invite people over? Will I, I know, I know people who are together that didn't live together before this happened and now are, are living together because, you know, otherwise they would probably only be able to see each other over Zoom. I know some people who have never met the person they're dating in person. Mm-hmm. It's just been strictly a, a Zoom relationship. Um, I uh, yeah, I think it's I think that that that's been it's been pretty nice to have. But at the same time, it also doubles the risk factor because you know if I'm maybe I'm home but my wife went out somewhere, or you know she's here but I went out somewhere. It's like that wherever you go, you just have to be mindful that like now you're two people that are constantly, you know, coming into contact with things. And so in that regard, and I understand like couples with kids, uh, you know, that, that only triples quadruples infinitesimally the, uh, exponentially the the risk factor for them. Uh, Yeah. Most, most couples that I personally know that that's a good sample size, uh, have claimed their relationships have gotten better as part of the, as part of the, the, um, quarantine, which I find very fascinating. I wouldn't have necessarily guessed that, but, um, I, I guess when you're going through, as you said, going through something together, um, does make a difference. Now, have any of your, any of your habits changed anything new that you've gotten into since quarantine started? Or, I mean, you've had a lot of life changes in the last couple of months. I do know, but, uh, but anything quarantine related, I will say, while you're thinking of that, I've gotten big into frozen pizzas. I never used to be a big frozen pizza guy. And I've, I've really gotten, I've tried a bunch of the different frozen pizzas and it's really been like a sad, but exciting part of my life. I'm definitely not depressed. (laughs) Um, I, for lifestyle changes, I, uh, I, I have not gotten into frozen pizza, but that's because I live in New Jersey now and we know pizza. We know pizza, Sean. Isn't Jer- that the state slogan, New Jersey? We know pizza. We know no, pizza. The, actually, actually, common misconception. The state slogan is, uh, "No, Your Honor, that is not my briefcase." Hey, oh, it's also Bada Bing, and it's also Jim Tan Laundry. Just love New Jersey. Big fans here. <laughs> but the uh, oh, and also yes, I will have more gravy on my disco fries. Hey, that's that's a good one. So, um. I, I haven't gotten into frozen pizzas. I did a lot more takeout because that was in the beginning. It kept changing, didn't it? It was like, first it was like, 
it was like no no takeout avoid it because people touch the they might sneeze on your pizza don't you can't get takeout yeah. only shop at stores and then they were like wait a minute wait a minute don't shop at stores because people are touching things sneezing on them and putting them back on the shelf stop shopping at stores that now you got to go back to ordering from no you got to do instacart then instacart was really big which yeah. i i did do a great number of times um and paid way too much money to have somebody else tell me sad Instacart. They were sad. out of strawberry Cheerios. <laughs> no, you can't have the apple nut Cheerios. We only have the regular Cheerios. I can't tell you how many times that happened to me. Um, that's something I I got surprisingly. I, I I did get a lot more into cereal. Oh, okay. I used, to, I used to hate cereal. Love it now. I'm I'm a big cereal. I'm a cereal turnover. Um, and Sean, I don't know if you've tried it yet. Oat milk. I, you know, I've never tried oat. Sell me oat on milk. oat milk. Why should oat I milk care? Oat milk has changed. It's changed the game for me. Um, number one, I, I'm not someone who always does very well with lactose, full disclosure. Um, I, I don't like to use the term lactose intolerant because I, I think I am a very tolerant person. Um, but oat milk has been a good it, – it's it's about half the calories and and like almost none of the fat you get from a normal glass of milk. And, uh, the, the thing is with oat milk is you, you have to go in with the same mindset that I always had about pizza hut and, and Domino's and other fast food pizzas is that, you know, I used to think of them as they're, they're fast food first and then pizza second. So you can't really compare them to like a New York slice. Cause they're two different, they're two different beasts. Two it's different good, it's good for what it is. It's good for what it is. Oat milk. That should be the slogan of oat milk. It's good for what it is. God, it's not marketing. bad. It really is not terrible tasting. It's actually very good tasting. But don't go in thinking that it's going to taste like milk. Because it. if I had to describe the taste, it's it's the, it's surprisingly the same texture as milk, which I would argue is more important. Mm -hmm. Right? Because if, if the texture is, is messed up, then you know, then 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 the game's the game is lost. You've lost the game. Uh, it's the same texture as milk. But the taste of it is more akin to the taste of after you finished a bowl of cereal, mm -hmm. say like a bowl of cornflakes or a sweeter cereal like Frosted Flakes or something like that. The milk after you finish the cereal, if you're, if you're one of the people that drinks that milk, oat milk will be very familiar just, to just you. Just that hint of sweetness. Exactly. It's, it's got that like almost honeyed sweet sweetness to it. Yeah. At the very end, and uh, and it's good. I, I I enjoy it. I'm I'm liking my oat milk experience. So so let me ask you this, Matt, because here's my thing with milk, right? I'm not a big. I, I very rarely drink milk. Uh, that's why I have very weak bones. And uh, you know, I the thing the problem I have with milk, it, I try the beverages I drink, especially the cold beverages, have to be what I describe as refreshing. Okay, I like. I'm really big. Pretty much all I drink is sparkling or um uh carbonated water shouldn't say sparkling but a carbonated water usually with some fruit in it or beer that's pretty much all i drink uh maybe a little bit of soda all of which i would consider to be refreshing would you consider oat milk to be refreshing no but okay like see, who's, but who considers milk refreshing it's, but that's, it's, but that's it's why i don't your... drink milk i was just curious if it was more refreshing okay I, I don't, then, then maybe oat milk is not for you. If I, it's it's I wouldn't say it's refreshing. No, I don't drink beverages I can't see through. Is kind of my is kind of my gimmick. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Then maybe 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 oat milk is not for but you. But I was gonna say I've but, tried it, so maybe I would like it. Yeah, I I don't know. It's 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 not something like when I think refreshing, I think like something I would really like to have on a very hot right. day, or right after I just got back from a run. And oat milk is not, so, that is not it. Let me phrase it this way. Have you ever had a glass of oat milk and put it down and went, ah. Yeah. Okay. To me, but that's it's not, refreshing. Okay. So that's like before I, I, I drink oat milk like before I go to bed and when I first wake up in the morning. But not like, wow, I, I usually have to have some water with it. Like you go for a jog, you're not, you don't like have a squeeze bottle of oat no, milk? No, sort of like, uh, like um, Anchorman. Yes. Yeah. Um, where he's drinking the milk, and milk was a bad choice. Yes. No. One of my favorite SNL sketches, uh, Cookie Dough Gatorade. 
uh, where it's literally thick cookie dough <laughs> coming out of a Gatorade bottle. Uh, very funny. Um, yeah. Well, it's interesting. I'm going to have to try it. I, I will so take I, the yeah, oat that's milk been challenge. Pretty good. I switched over to oat milk during the quarantine, and the oat milk was actually a consequence of the cereal. Like, I started eating more cereal and then thinking, like, um, if I put oat milk, at first it was like, if I put oat milk in this, I won't even taste the oat milk. So even if it's bad, you know, the cereal will disguise it. And then I ate it. I was like, that's actually pretty good. So I, then I started just drinking it. So, um, yeah, oat milk, oat milk was big. Um, I would like to say that I became a better baker mm. through the experience. That was one of my quarantine goals. But the move kind of, I, I started the baking stuff. I, I think I sent you the picture of the orange muffins that came out very bad but um they uh that that was like going to be the start of my baking odyssey and i I never got there because of the move the move just kind of took everything but now that i'm settled and finally like back i think i I would like to get back into baking yeah so that's the goal baking is one of those things that as a quarantined single person there is not much motivation for baking i will say uh because anything i bake i have to eat and it's I, I basically completely stopped baking when quarantine started. I was too busy Can't eating my frozen it, pizzas. Put it all on Instagram. That's what the gram is for. I, I my cooking. Or my brag baking, about it in Zoom meetings. Not that brag not about it in Zoom meetings. Be like, look at look at this pie well, I, I made that none of you get to eat. No, back in, back in the old days, I would have brought some into work to share, and you can't do that. But you can still eat it on your Zoom meeting and brag about it brag. to all your coworkers. Oh, oh, oh. I, I would have loved that. Uh, I do eat on I do I do eat on <laughs> Teams calls. I do. Um, I definitely do. I do see the. I I kind of empathize there. I I, I wouldn't want to bake like an entire sheet of brownies and then be like, I have to eat all these and myself I've done that. now. Like, I've done that. Although yeah. the, the other day, like I said, we've I've all gotten, been there. I've gotten into frozen food and I don't know why, but they had um they had a sale on uh, the original chip witch. The, oh. the the chocolate chip cookies with the ice cream between them. Sure. Damn, that was good. Yeah, yeah. that that brings back the memories. Damn, that was good. I'm so fat. Uh, and by the way, Newman's <sighs> own pepperoni. That, that's my that's Newman's my frozen own pepperoni. Yes, that is my pizza. Oh, is that is that your go to? That, that it's my, frozen. There are many great frozen item. pizzas out there. I would say if you're looking like, hey, what's a great frozen pizza? That's my pick. So I like I got into Red Red Baron. Pizza. Red Baron, I think Red Baron is pretty good. That style of pizza, I think Tombstone is a little better. Okay. I haven't had Tombstone in forever. That but, was a... but Red Baron's good. Red Red Baron's definitely good. I mean, I I think the Stouffer's French bread is a classic, but you really can't compare that to any because it's kind of its own thing. Yeah. Um, French bread pizza is its own thing. There really aren't a lot of pizzas I've had I didn't like. My wife is a big fan of the DiGiorno. That's probably the one I would say I don't like, only because yeah, I I, I, I only like the crust. Well, but that's I what would it like is. cut the crust off and eat it by I, itself. The but. frozen, I don't do frozen pizzas with the rising crust because I just don't think they. I would much rather have a thinner, kind of flat bready style, thin crust pizza. Those do so much better frozen. I almost never buy rising crust frozen pizzas. Yeah, because then you get a nice crisp on it, and yeah, that's not. It's not so bready. Uh, Matt, is there anything else you would like to, to discuss when it comes to coronavirus, or have we sort of solved all the world's problems? Oh, as we always do, I think we uh, think we really touched every uh, touched every surface that we could possibly touch, and we wiped our opinions all over it. So now it's there forever, and uh, you can't our- can't you gotta you gotta uh, backtrace it. You gotta that's something we sh- we we didn't talk about is uh, contact tracing. Yeah, you know, it's funny, Matt. I've been tested twice for COVID. I've been exposed to people with COVID, and no one's ever called me. So um, I don't know how well it's working. I tried to, I tried to get a job as a contact oh. tracer. They never contacted me back. So Not very good. They should have hired you to contact <laughs> you. Yeah. Um, thought that'd be a fun job. Just call someone up. And, you Where sick? were you? Where you have sick? you been? How you feel? You're a liar. <laughs> yeah. What? What? You think you're gonna be like in an interrogation room with a single we lamp hanging from right the... here? You liar! You were at the you were at the uh, quickie mart, weren't you? And I'm right. I'm right next to you. Cool it. Cool it, Matt. Take a break. Take a break. I'm the good cop. Take <laughs> a break. Cop. Would you like a glass cop, of water? <laughs> we know you've been through a lot, and yes, uh, we, we'd yes. like to really thank you. My partner here. Yeah, he, he, he just 
he loves his job. He flies off the handle sometimes. Here, watch. And then, like, they take a sip of the water, and then we use that to test, and it's like, we knew you were yeah. positive, you son of a bitch. <laughs> you liar. Book him, uh, Dano. Sean, Sean and Matt, Corona Cops. Corona Cops. Ugh, that's what's weird. I, I, I will maybe end on, on this question to you, Matt, because uh, one thing, we talked about movies, but TV, there's sort of this big question of, do TV shows write coronavirus into their seasons there's actually a new show on freeform love in the time of corona that is literally just a sort of this is us uh romantic sort of show specifically in the age of corona i am of the opinion that i don't want my fictional shows to be showing me the bummer of the real world i'm in yeah i i'm in a weird place with that too with with podcasts i listen to and videos i watch on youtube like I think that they're they're all becoming really quickly dated at, in terms of like you can very much tell that they filmed this or they recorded this during the corona outbreak and they will always be like that. It's kind of like they will always be frozen in that uh, that uh, amber is like the corona amber of like 2020. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't like anything that's based around the one. I think the worst defender that I've seen is on um, it's on TLC. It's a show. Oh god! It's a, it's 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 a show that they clearly made because they can't film on location anywhere. So it's like it's it's got like two people will call in, and you're so and they're they're like looking for people to date, and and they have like people that'll call in and be like, hey, I think you're really sexy. You want to go on a date with like they're like they're. It's a dating show, but yeah. it's it's very clearly only. Do you know the show I'm talking about? I, I don't. Okay. I don't, but I, I get the, I get the, I mean, we saw, you know, 30 Rock and Parks and Rec both did sort of remote reunions and. Yeah, I, I thought maybe you would know it because it's on right after 90 Day Fiance. I got, and... I got bored. And Matt, if I went through every series I watched during the quarantine, we, we wouldn't have enough time. I, I That one came and went. <laughs> I'm past that. Came and went. Came and it's went. Passe. A lot of them did. Uh yeah, it's just a it's just a bummer to me. It's sort of it, it always goes. I am always reminded of the uh, the West Wing nine eleven episode, where it's like it's so weird in that show's run how they sort of just like have this narrative thread going and then just stop everything to talk about it. And I'm like, that's why Friends didn't have a nine eleven episode. Like it's just weird. Like just just go past it. Funny you mention that. I I, I don't know if if I talk we. We did our very first episode of this show talking about Aaron Sorkin. Yeah, we sure did. And uh, the 9-11 episode of The West Wing was, I think, one of the most offensive things that I've seen. Like, in terms of 9-11, I thought it was, like, extremely juvenile and, 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 and like you said, inc- incredibly incongruous with the spirit of the rest weird. of the show. And it was weird. Weird and and just yeah, out of place. I hated it. It was one of my probably my my like least favorite show nine eleven things. Yeah. Like some shows handled it very well. Like uh and, and some some like friends just chose to not, you know, touch it at all. And I think that for in many cases that was the best response. Well, but. And I also understand 9-11 and coronavirus are very different in that coronavirus affects the entire world, people all across the country. Not, You know what I mean when I'm comparing the two. I get that it's different, but it's also, you know, it's funny, I, I, I post stuff on social media for actually a couple companies now, but, um, you know, I, I try and post pictures of people and, and I have a boss who always says to me, well, Sean, they're not wearing a mask in the photo. And I say, the photo was taken last year. And they go, well, it doesn't matter. We don't want people to think we're we don't care about masks. And I'm like, so we're sort of like retrofitting history. Oh yeah. It's like and it's, rewriting history. It's yeah. just sort of a weird, well, it's just, it's just like, we have to be so focused on it that we can't ignore, you know, like, I don't know Matt, if you've seen like commercials or TV shows now where it's like, Oh, those people are standing too close. Like it was shot years ago, but you're like, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be do. I feel like, like they're touching. I don't feel good about so that. One of, I, I had that, one of, one of the things that I did over the quarantine, I'm a big baseball guy, as you, as you know, um, over the quarantine, because there was no baseball, I, I found a number of games online and I re, I rewatched it. I wanted, the goal was to rewatch all of the world series from 1999 to 2009. Cool. I only made it through 99 and most of 2000, but <laughs> game turns out baseball games are really, really long. And, uh, that's what Tough people sport. complain about. But, um, 
the uh, I, I I was I was in the middle of the '99 World Series, and I was thinking I was looking at all the like people in the stadium, and it immediately occurred to me it was just like this is this is weird to me, like this is this is so foreign to me now, like that all these everybody's like on top of each other and so close together. Um, there was a commercial. It was a very very quintessential '90s tech commercial where it showed like a number of businessmen walking through the city. And they're all like, it was like a live shot of, of New York, like a street in New York City. And it was like AT&T Solutions has yeah. the, has the, yeah, it's like has the solutions for your business. And like, it shows like a, like a, like a electrical bolt, like kind of shoot through and like goes through like all the businessmen and then goes into like a big CPU unit in like a tower. It's like, we have the hidden technology inside of our CPU to, to get to, to make your business run the most efficiently. And then it shows like a old old computer that was very very new back then and and seemingly high tech but they when they were going through the city i was like everybody's too close together they're too close together like it's it's just uh <laughs> it's uh it's your cat yeah he does this <laughs> does start business meetings uh no it, it's it's wild to me matt you know i i the nba is a good example for me i've been watching a lot of nba since they came back in the bubble and now i think to myself like how did they ever let fans sit that close to the court like literally their feet could like reach into the boundaries of the court like that's what like how was that ever a thing yeah, oh, NBA especially because even that like that's indoors on top of it. Yeah, I mean it's just, yeah, it's just really it's just really crazy. Um, Matt, who knows? Maybe we'll look back at this and uh, this will all seem silly, uh, or we'll all be dead and there won't be anything to look back on. Uh, but that was sort of our our discussion about coronavirus. The good news is, Matt, the future of up for debate. We're gonna be here. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're always social distancing, not only from one another, but also from all the fans. We only, we only touch you via your ears, uh, and we do it very safely. We, uh, we live, we live in our own little podcast bubbles. We do. So. We're virus free in your phone, and mm -hmm. uh, Matt, we have got some excellent stuff coming up on the Up for Debate calendar. I could not possibly be more excited about. Uh, before we get to next month, I, we can even tease October now because uh, Scaretober, I don't know, name TBD, uh, is coming. We're going to be doing some scary movies, some scary books. Uh, it's going to be a fun month. But, Matt, the next four weeks, Sean Tember is finally here. I never thought it would uh, arise. Matt, are I never you thought it would occur, but here uh, we are. On a scale from 1 to 10, how excited are you? Two. I'm like two. Okay. Or, I'm like a two or three. Okay. okay. We we gotta amp that up. We gotta <laughs> amp that up big time, buddy. I've been working on this for months. It's very exciting. Uh, Matt, I I don't want to give it all away, but I will just say we're gonna have we're gonna have special topics, special guests. Uh, am I allowed to tease what next week's show, our our kickoff show, is gonna be? Sure. Uh, Matt, get excited because next week I have written you a custom RPG. You're gonna play through. What? Bring your D20. It's not Dungeons and Dragons. It's 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 uh, you know there's no ranks or classes or anything like there's no battles. Uh but it is a, it is a puzzler and there's going to be a, a real world time element. You've got to solve it before the episode is over. All right. I I just went from a 2 to a 7. So. I, I I mean Matt, I literally I'm not joking like I have Call maps, me very I have maps and diagrams and notes like I'm <laughs> I'm beyond psyched. Uh All right. It, it's I, gonna be I'm I'm sold on Sean Tember. Uh, I am, and that's just one week. Much that's much that's more excited week. now. We, we got a whole month of this. And thinking back, you know, I I remember when you when you wrote that murder mystery for my birthday. Yes. And yeah. If if it, if it was half as good as that, I am I am at like a twelve then. And, and I will say, Matt, the the sort of setting and themes of this are very Sean Jennings. So. I am absolutely excited. Uh, folks are going to want to tune in for that and all the rest of the planning for the rest of the month. Um, it's 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 going to be great. Up for debate that TV is the website. Go there, uh, get all the episodes. You can check out the whole Rocky series we just finished, uh, as well as all the old, other older stuff. And of course, subscribe wherever you get podcasts with a video version on YouTube. And of course, you can get a hold of us at Up for Debate TV on Twitter or email us up for debate TV at gmail.com. Matt, that's going to do it. That's all she wrote. So say stay safe out there, kids. Keep social distancing, wear those masks, stay COVID-free so you can come back and join us. But until then, on behalf of Matt, I'm Sean. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time for another 
up for debate.